Thanks, Kathleen. Um, so this is the one you've been waiting for. Good, obviously. Um, uh, and this, this is an important topic. This is patients who've, who've, who've clearly come to harm uh, and talk about outcomes as well. It's quite a lot to cover in 15 minutes. We'll see how we go. Um, it's chapter 12. Um, this is what we already know. Uh, most deaths from anaphylaxis uh, occur well in well under an hour. For perioperative hypersensitivity, the, the, the commonest um, figure quoted is 4%, uh, but that probably comes from one paper which didn't necessarily say 4%, which lots of people requote. And the Australians um, highlight their none out of 264 deaths uh, in 2000, between 2000 and 2009 in Western Australia. Those are grade, grade one to four uh, anaphylaxis. Um, ours, of course, are grade three to four, plus fives. Um, and there was a recent paper in France, which I found and then lost, which just included NMBAs, and that was 4% as well. ASPA is known to increase the risk in the, uh, in the community, and patients with a raised MCT to start with have an increased risk of uh, fatality if, uh, if it's an envenomation anaphylaxis. Uh, we know that, commonly, uh, that cardiac arrest commonly occurs within five minutes. It's drug-induced. The elderly at probably increased risk of mortality from out-of-hospital uh, cardiac arrest um, from uh, allergy. Um, and sadly, who's the, who's the source of the Western Australia work, uh, suggested there was no increased risk if, patient, if you continued with surgery, if patients had had grade three and perhaps grade four anaphylaxis in this series. So, someone said some of the figures weren't raised three, so fortunately the really important ones are highlighted here. So there were 10 deaths out of 266 cases, 3.8%, so that's sort of in the, in the middle of the middle park. But remember, we reviewed all deaths, so all the deaths were reviewed. Um, and <clears throat> so if we included all our patients, you could take that down to 2.2%. I'm happy with 3.8%. So that's one in almost a third of a million procedures, or one in a quarter of a million general anaesthetics. It's infrequent. None of them were due to drug errors. In fact, there are only two drug errors in the whole of the uh, series. These are the patients, predominantly female, but predominantly uh, the, the surgical population is female. They were older than the patients in the activity survey, so half of them over 65 instead of a quarter over 65. They were very much predominantly less fit. So ASA 4 and 5, less than 2%, ASA 4, 20%, ASA 3, 60%. And they were very predominantly obese. So 21% of the population were obese or morbidly obese in the activity survey, and it's, I think it's 26 in the adult population, and 90, that should be a 1, 90% of the patients who died were obese. Unclear why. There were f slightly more emergencies than there should have been. Um, and interestingly, we haven't looked at this, uh, covered this in great detail, but there are three cardiac operations, and only 1% of, of, of surgery is cardiac surgery. What are you going to see when it happens? So uh, the, the Oxford is uh, presenting features and the Cambridge is uh, present during the event. Uh, so uh, Oxford always loses, um, uh, by definition. Um, so you will see hypotension, quite a lot of bronchospasm. Remember, 18% of all presenting features, but 40% of, of the presenting features in this small series of deaths. Bradycardia, quite prominent. Tachycardia, not prominent. No rash, no airway swelling, no airway difficulty. Uh, it's all PEA, with or without bradycardia. No other arrhythmias in the deaths, but there were in the cardiac arrests. Uh, five survived resuscitation, and resuscitation was prolonged. The, the, the people who worked on these patients, or worked for these patients, worked really hard. A median of 39 minutes, everybody had resuscitation beyond 25 minutes. One patient went onto ECMO, three patients went to the cath lab and had PCI. Um, and so four survived, one died, I think, pretty much at the doors of intensive care, and four of them died of MOFs uh, subsequently, multiple organ failure subsequently. Uh, more information, so it's all managed quite well there. Nigel's mentioned the adrenaline. He's got four milligrams, I've got five milligrams. There's a discrepancy. It's the way you work out the median of 10. Uh, so only one patient got glucagon and one got vasopressin. And half of them had steroids, half of them had antihistamines. So someone wrote, asked the question uh, before lunch about that. Yeah, only half of these patients had steroids. And they didn't have much fluid. That's not enough fluid, probably. They had, the median was one and a half litres in the first hour and one and a half litres in the first five hours in total. So that's cumulatively. One patient had four and a half litres in the first hour and nine in total, but the rest were all, I think, below four litres. 
Not much. We should be giving more fluid in these circumstances. This is what people did. A patient was due for cardiac surgery, cardiac arrest as a result of anaphylaxis. Resuscitation included an hour of CPR, ECMO, cardiac catheterization, and placement of a stent. People went a long way to try and save these already often uh, quite unhealthy patients. Um, and again, patients with comorbidities, uh, obese, ASA3, uh, PA arrest, so this is all typical, prolonged CPR, multi-organ failure. And this was not uncommon that the decision about how long to carry on with the patients, treatment and their ultimate outcome, was a balance between their underlying condition and their un underlying comorbidity, as is so often in critical care these days, and actually what was going on in front of them, and a similar patient down there. Uh, so, uh, beta blockers. Yes, someone's raised a question about that. So, disproportionately large number of people who died were receiving beta blockers. Only one got glucagon, and they got it after an hour of resuscitation. And similar graph for ACE inhibitors as well. Those who died after anaphylaxis were predominantly older with cardiac disease and more obese than those who survived anaphylaxis. And the, and the differences are quite stark. We've intentionally not done any statistical analysis on it, but it's quite stark. Asthma is a risk for fatal anaphylaxis. Well, not if you're having an anaesthetic. I think that's pretty clear. You can rule that out. Antibi so the, cul the culprits, they're, they're, they're pretty much in the same proportion as the culprits across the board. So they're muscle relaxants and they're antibiotics. They're not exclusively. So one death from chlorhexidine, one death from, from, from a gelatin. This is the death from a gelatin. Someone had a new axial block. Uh, and then a general anaesthetic, they had hypotension, put some gelatin up, speeded it up. They subsequently died from this event. Investigation, they all had a, a mast cell tryptase. None of them had specific IGs. None were, were uh, referred to the allergy clinic, or, or, and only one had a PM. We can discuss that later. I'll just jump through that one. Cardiac arrests, 15% of patients had cardiac arrests. Uh, back to Oxford Cambridge, Cambridge wins again. Uh, Everybody gets hypotension. Everybody with perioptor anaphylaxis gets hypotension. Uh, again, quite a lot of bronchospasm. No absent capnography. No, pretty much in terms of presentation, no rash, no swelling. So the more severe your anaphylaxis is, the less likely you are to have rash or swelling. And, and we only had one airway uh, event in these 266 cases. So survivors, very short periods of CPR, and they survived. Again, the vast majority PEA. A small number of VF arrests, and all of those presented, their presenting feature was tachycardia. 40% of patients, roughly, uh, had prolonged preceding hypertension, which I'll come back to, and arrhythmias were uncommon. So the idea of patients with cardiac disease that you give adrenaline to, and they then go into an SVT or AF or VT, no, we didn't see that. And you know, for an in-hospital cardiac arrest, that's a very high survival rate. Special circumstances, I know. So the cardiac arrest is not particularly unfit. There were more patients on ACE inhibitors. Uh, nothing special about the drugs administered um, and no evidence of adrenaline-induced uh, problems. Uh, they all went to ITU. I'll skip through that. Profound hypotension. So this is quite interesting. This is a group that sort of threw itself out of us. And one of the, one of the things about doing the NAPS is certain, certain groups will sort of throw themselves at you and themes will emerge. And this was one that, that made us scratch our heads a bit. So everybody got hypotension. Three quarters of them blood pressure below 60, a third of them blood pressure below 50 without cardiac arrest. At what point do you start CPR? Well, that's the answer. People don't really start CPR very much. So if you, there you go, cardiac arrest 100%, unrecordable BP 50%, below 50, 9%, 2%. So, yeah. If you put an arterial line in, you can't detect a pulse once the blood pressure below, below 50. Um, and if you don't have an arterial line, your, your non-invasive blood pressure will overread the blood pressure. So when are you going to start CPR? Because these are patients who are unconscious, they have no signs of life, and they're pulseless. Those are indications for CPR if the patient's awake. So I don't know the answer, but we made a decision having discussed it with some proper experts. And in terms of overall management, this is all cases, overall management, the area that isn't so good, perhaps... Uh, inevitable because we made that decision, but we didn't think we thought this was probably the area where things could have happened. And given that 40% of the cardiac arrests are preceded by prolonged hypotension, 
just how long are you going to wait until, is, well, is this blood pressure 46, is that the lowest it's going to get? Well, I know, I'll wait for it to cycle another couple of minutes, so it goes down to 30, then I'll see if I start some CPR. Well, maybe I'll take it down to 28, I don't know. Um, anyway, so, so these are, let's go back one. So these are four different groups, deaths, non-fatal cardiac arrest, so only nine of the deaths had a cardiac arrest. So there's so 31 uh, survivors of cardiac arrest, one, one patient who died later didn't have a cardiac arrest at the time, 79 patients who didn't have a cardiac arrest and survived but had a blood pressure below 50, and then all the others. And these two groups appear to be very different, and this group appear to be pretty much the same in terms of who they are. In terms of how they're managed and their, well, we'll come to their outcomes, how they're managed, they seem to be rather different. So this group had a very severe reaction, they're profoundly hypotension and pulseless. And diagnosis of, of anaphylaxis was slower than in this group. Prompt treatment was probably the slowest. The numbers are not very different, but there's a, quite a few where they're, where they're smaller. Um, uh, and we didn't think their management was good. We thought their management was poor in more cases. Did they have worse outcome? It's difficult to know, really. Um, they, the median severity of their harm was moderate, which fits more with the fatal cardiac arrests than it does with all others whose median was low, which actually equates to almost no harm. All, the, almost all of these had no harm because, because um, low harm is, is basically requiring first aid. Um, so there's just a concern about these patients that perhaps they're not being treated as they, sh as they should be. The drug distribution in terms of what everybody had, there's no pattern there. They, they're, they're all the same drugs affecting the, effect, uh, causing dip, the, the reactions. And I'm actually going to skip through that one as well. Uh, lastly, outcomes is we're running shortish of time. 37% uh, of patients had their length of stay prolonged by a day, 38% uh, by more than one day, and one patient by 150 days. Um, so there's a long tail to how long people were in hospital for, for a period of time. Um, and most people recovered with, with essentially no detriment. But a third of people had significant harm. Moderate harm is like going to ITU or uh, uh, having to go back to surgery or other, other, other significant problems. And about 5% had severe harm or death. This is what they had, and I won't go through this chart, but essentially what we have is on the left in part A, so when, when the patients had been, as it were, dealt with by the anaesthetist and referred on, this was the proportion, this was the, the number of patients who were reporting altered mood. And then when they were seen in the allergy clinic, this was the number of patients who were, who were reporting those problems. So 67 uh, patients were reporting mild symptoms, 29 moderate, 8 severe, when signed off by the anaesthetist. And when they were seen 101 days later by the allergist, uh, there, there, were, there were slightly smaller numbers. But there are significant numbers of patients who have severe and moderate symptoms, and they include altered mood, altered memory, altered mobility, anxiety, a lot of anxiety, some post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, a few cardiac and uh, acute, acute kidney injuries. So there are some, most people recover very well from these events, but not everybody. We haven't talked about recommendations much in these talks. There's a lot of stuff to pack in, and we're throwing huge numbers of numbers at you. So I'll try and go through a few of these. So severe perioperative anaphylaxis, and we, we consider this profound hypertension here to be blood pressure less than 50. Uh, so those patients who are high risk, the elderly, the obese, ASA3, patients on beta blocker ACE inhibitors, be prepared to escalate your treatment very early. If your blood pressure is less than 50, we think you should start CPR at the same time as adrenaline and liberal fluid administration. Uh, if they're taking beta blockers and they have refractory treatment, get on with the glucagon, and that's why it needs to be nearby. Ditto vasopressin uh, for, for uh, refractory hypotension, and these should be available within 10 minutes. Consider, as Nigel has said, a vasopressor should be anticipated pretty much after your first or second dose of anaphylaxis, on the basis that 75% of patients went to ITU, half of patients had vasopressor um, uh, uh, infusions post-op, and a third of patients had uh, significant sequelae afterwards. We did not feel that it was sensible to carry on with surgery after severe perioperative anaphylaxis. If it occurred before surgery, we suggest it doesn't start. Um, and if it's during an operation, get the operation done as quickly as possible, unless it's a really important operation. 
I think you know what I mean by a really important operation. They're all important. Um, severe anaphylaxis equals ITU. We were not able to be definitive about how long someone should stay in after grade three to four parent anaphylaxis, but after a life-threatening reaction, we felt that it would be imprudent to discharge them the same day. Um, and we felt that all cases should, could usefully be discussed with an allergy clinic when there are fatalities. So that's the summary with my time up by about five seconds. Deaths, quite a quest, profound heart potential. I'll leave you to read that yourself. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. Uh, a huge amount of information there, and we are going to have a question section uh, at the end of this. So we'll move on uh, swiftly with uh, Professor Bill Egner, who's, who you've met already this morning, and he's going to tell us about the investigations.